Today is the sixth and final week of a series called Christ in Me, where we're asking ourselves, what does it look like? Okay, I believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the second person of the Trinity put on flesh, lived the perfect life that I should have lived but didn't, went to a cross and died the death I should have died but did not, raised victorious on the third day, sends his Holy Spirit empowering his people. I believe this, I become a Christian, now what? Does that affect anything? Sadly, and I haven't spent a lot of energy on this, American culture, Western culture has us so drunk on individualism, you would, you would have people believe that somebody could become a Christian and it not affect anybody around them. Like, that's good for you. I'm so glad you found religion. That's great. This is the spirit of the age. That's for you. But the problem is that there's an assumption that the whole thing was a personal theological checkbox of I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, when in fact scripture says the third person of the Trinity just invaded somebody's heart. If you've read the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit of God shows up, do things change? The second verse of the Bible says the Spirit was hovering over the waters and from chaos came order. The whole physical cosmos came from the Holy Spirit coming and participating in creation. Other points from Sinai forward, when God shows up, people are terrified they're going to die because they know that they are sinners and they're going to get incinerated in the presence of a holy God. But I become a Christian and I might be tempted to think that, that no one else is going to feel it. No, no, no. An atomic bomb just went off in your heart. Your family's going to feel it. Your coworkers are going to feel it. Your classmates are going to feel it. Your neighbors are going to feel it. So, we've asked, what does it look like when Jesus invades your parenting? When Jesus invades your friendships? When Jesus invades your marriage? Today, we're talking about Jesus in society, civics. What does it look like in culture when one person or a lot of people decide to love and treasure Jesus Christ above all else? How does that, if at all, affect culture? I'm so glad you asked because I just happened to have an entire sermon ready to go, pointed in that direction. Those of you who enjoy taking notes, let's start off in Matthew 5. Jesus makes me holy in order to bless society. As your first blank. Jesus makes me holy, if I'm a Christian, in order to bless society. Let's go to Matthew 5 together. If you're in the hardback, that's page 802. Thank you, sir. Jesus speaking to his followers. You are the salt of the earth, But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Did you hear that? Jesus didn't say, do good deeds so you get to go to heaven. No, he's already calling God your father. God has adopted you. You do good deeds because the darkness desperately needs the light. Your friends need to see God in you if you love Jesus. And so we do our best for our words, actions, passions to all drip of Jesus to show Jesus to people who need Jesus. Is Gregory redundant today or what? We are already sons the way that Jesus talks in this text. We're already sons that your father would be glorified, your father in heaven. This is the best news ever, guys. The whole world is drunk on the idea that I've got to do enough stuff so God will love me. And Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago and said, nope. Brothers and sisters, we are deceived, and somewhere deep down, we are arrogant if we think we can do enough to walk into heaven on our own merit. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Let me uh, invite you into a theoretical world. Today, 
Greg Kaiser finds a way to stop sinning. I find a way, somehow. No thought is rebellious against Christ. No word is hurtful toward other people, nothing. And I get to live another 40, 50 years and I never ever sin ever again. Do I get to go to heaven? We have one wrong answer. Do we have any right answers? (laughs) Guys, only God himself could count the amount of sins I've committed in 38 years. You don't have a supercomputer strong enough to count my sins. And if I'd only sinned once, how am I gonna pay for that one sin? I have offended a righteous and holy God. What am I gonna possibly do? Right answer, over here. I believe Jesus claimed about himself that his cross successfully, beautifully takes his perfect life and offers it to me freely. Brothers and sisters, I do not grow tired of telling you that when I die, I am walking up to the pearly gates and I'm gonna have a name badge on that says Jesus Christ. And they're gonna let me walk in as if I lived the perfect life of Christ. Not because I am Christ, but because his holiness was given to me as a free gift. And that is the only claim in all religions anywhere of God dying for his people. You know that, right? Confucius never made that claim. Joseph Smith never made that claim. Avon Lady never made that claim. I'm just saying there are a lot of religions. Um, Jesus makes me holy in order to bless society. Two things he says about holiness. To the church, he says, you're the salt of the earth. So we've got refrigerators now, so this is lost on us. You preserve food so it doesn't have to be eaten with, you know, within two or three days. You preserve culture. You allow cultural decay to be slowed or even stopped because you have love inside you that comes directly from God himself. Yeah, if you piece the dots together, you didn't like that one. Cultural decay is directly correlated to a church that is on fire in its love of God and love of people. So when culture decays and when culture rots, the church has no voice to sit there and complain and moan and say, things are getting darker. Jesus would gently hold up a mirror and say, what are you doing? You are salt. You are light. You don't like the darkness? What are you gonna do about it? Light doesn't complain about darkness. It destroys it. Love doesn't complain about hate. It eradicates it. Right? Come on now. So you are the light of the world. Wow. Because we're awesome? Okay. Yeah, we would go out to Paul's letters. We hold this treasure in jars of clay. We are broken and fragile. We're not that awesome, but there's this light inside us, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that is beautiful, powerful. So as an example, when we think of salt and light, let me put before you, let me submit to you the history of things like orphanages, abolitionist movements, and the foundation of hospitals. There is a 2,000 year history of Christians stepping into horrible messes that nobody else will step into. I've shared with you guys before, but I'll say it for those who are new. During the dark ages when the plague was killing an estimated third of Europe, and it lasted for over 100 years, it was not some quick little pandemic and they put on masks and everything was okay. For over 100 years, people were dying this horrible death. They did not know where it was coming from. And the pastors of England regularly walked into the towns that got infected, not running away. Now, when a disease is ravaging your continent for over 100 years, what this means is you were born and raised in a world where you knew the plague could come. This is not just, oh, it happened all of a sudden. No, you were raised in a world where you knew death could come and decided to be a pastor in that kind of a world. You chose to walk in. This is right, right, like first responders, what do first responders do? They move the opposite direction the rest of us move. To save, to heal, to bless. Jesus makes me holy 
in order to bless society around me, to bless my neighbors, to bless the culture, to preserve it from decay and moral rot and to shine light into the darkness. Everybody wants the blessings of the light to the problems that in my flesh, I don't want the light. I'm not supposed to reference uh, filthy rated R movies, but since you're all sinners and I know you've already seen it, I'm going to. Was that loaded? Okay, so my children of the 80s, um, Breakfast Club, totally vile movie, but since you've already seen it, probably. Breakfast Club takes five high school kids at Saturday, Saturday school, they're all there for their own reasons, and they could not be more different from each other. And then they are uh, all friends by the end of Saturday school. And, and I realized at the end of the movie, I go, oh my gosh, they just built the kingdom without the king. This is secular humanism. It doesn't matter how much we're different from each other, how much we hate each other for different reasons. The secular humanist belief is if you just put people together and they could see each other's humanity, they would all find a way to love each other, respect each other, everything would be fine. Nobody would get killed, right? How's that worked for Asia? The continent of Asia, put a bunch of people on the same continent. There won't be any wars, it'll be fine. How's that worked for Europe, right? There is no evidence to support that you can take human beings and everything's just gonna somehow be okay. That is trying to create a kingdom. You want the kingdom of God. I want the fruit of everybody not being sinful. I want everybody to be kind and loving and joyful. And I want there still to be no Jesus because he just demands too much of me. I want to be God. Sorry, did I say that out loud? I want to be God. You read Genesis 3? That's my problem. I want his throne. That's my fundamental problem. But it's weird because it's hard to climb up there and then it's so much bigger than my derriere. I'm like, maybe this isn't my throne. Maybe it's somebody else's. Second, if I'm a Christian, Jesus saves me into a family to create a model for society. Jesus saves me into a family to create a model for society. He doesn't just save me individually from my sins. He does that, but I'm immediately adopted into a family. Turn with me to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Acts is a history of the early church. This is literally just in the weeks following Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. We're gonna go to what might be the, uh, in some ways, the apex of the book, 242. Acts 242, and we're gonna hear this description of the early church. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Does this sound like a cool church? Sound like a church you'd want to join? How much individualism was in that text? There was an individual mentioned at the end, the Lord, and he's tripersonal. So really there's no individualism in this text whatsoever. There is a community shaped and marked and saved by a community. Father, Son, and Spirit creates humanity and saves humanity. And this group of Jesus lovers are starting to look like Jesus. They're starting to act like Jesus. Do you know if you're a Christian? that You know you're not flying solo, right? I mean, you can fly solo as a Christian. You're just doing it wrong. You're shooting yourself in the foot. It's like being told that vegetables are good for you, and so you decide that you're gonna eat only carrots the rest of your life. You might not physically die, but you're not thriving either. American individualism would have you say, I'm a Christian now, I'm gonna go home and read my Bible by myself, I'm gonna watch sermons on YouTube, and that's Christianity. The only problem is there's not a drop of church history to back up that thinking, and there's nothing in scripture to back up that thinking. Other than that, you're fine. I'm not saying this because I'm mad at you. 
I'm saying you're sucking on a carrot over and over and over again, and there's more for you. Your brothers and sisters have the Holy Spirit inside them. They've received spiritual gifts for the express purpose of blessing and building you up. That's what 1 Corinthians says about spiritual gifts that is clear that nobody fights over. They are for the building up of the church. And your father who saved you, he is a community. Don't think that a communal God trying to make you into his image is gonna make you an individual. A communal God who knows the joy of perfect love, perfect affection, perfect adoration for all time, he's gonna make you into a community. That's why the culmination of history at the end of the book is a wedding. The lamb, Jesus Christ, and his church, billions of people united to each other in perfect love and right worship of our savior. And this creates a model society. So those of you guys who've been around a little while, you've heard me many times use Disneyland as illustrations because I love Disneyland. Well, the bad part about loving history is that you find out all kinds of brutal things about your heroes, right? You, You deify somebody, study a little bit deeper and you'll find out the mess. So... Before Walt died, he dreamed of this really cool city. He called it the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, what later became Epcot. And he was not envisioning a park where people were just in blatant hedonism, spending money to have fun. That's, that ended up being what happened because he wasn't there to control it. But when he was in the early 60s dreaming about it and have, storyboarding it and drawing pictures, it was to be a city that people lived and worked in and transportation of the future, agriculture of the future, this, that, and the other. He wanted to build a city from the ground up that was designed according to his vision. And I'm not here to throw him under the bus, but I just gotta be honest. The the pictures are public information. His description of it is all public information. It's really well recorded. He designed a city without a single church in it. And if you listen to his words in the way he's describing even the creation of Disneyland and the way he, what he, his value was for fairy tales, he believed the core of his being that human beings could be good enough on their own. He was a secular humanist to his core. Humanity is gonna figure it out. Humanity is gonna solve our problem. How illogical if we stop and go, I dug this pit, but me and my shovel are gonna solve it. I'm going to get myself out with the same shovel and the same behavior and the same thinking. Brothers and sisters, there is an experimental prototype community of tomorrow. It's the bride of Christ. It is the church where Jesus is king. We don't get to vote for him. We don't get to fight over it every two to four years. He is king. We are gladly his subjects by faith and it shows a lost and dying world, a piece of what heaven is going to look like. It starts with joyful submission to Christ, and that's why most of Citrus Heights is not interested. We don't quit, we don't pout, we don't fold our hands because we see 2,000 years of church history of most people not being interested in submission to Christ. No, we joyfully will leave the 99 to chase the one. If we believe there's one person, maybe you're here today, who is interested in being deeply and fully connected to their creator, the church is an image of the city of God. This is why 1,700 years ago, our brother Augustine wrote this way too large of a book called The City of God. I used to be a part of a theological tribe a little over a decade ago that really held highly the reading of rich theological books, but they never said The City of God was 1,100 pages. So I saw it a couple of years ago on Amazon and it was only six bucks, paperback. I go, wow, this is awesome. I could read Augustine. I could be really smart. And it showed up and I thought I had a brick for the construction of an orphanage or something. It was yikes and it's still sitting on my shelf. Haven't cracked the first page. I'm so intimidated by the thing. Our brother Augustine had a lot to say when he pondered what does it look like for the people of God to actually invade civics through their behavior not by running for office and changing the laws and shoving those laws onto the people. Hey, let's just live out the kingdom of God that that Jesus already described. Jesus said the kingdom is like a tree that grows so big, there's room in the branches for every creature. 
Like there, there's no limit to church growth. Anybody who wants to follow Jesus is allowed to follow Jesus. The invitation is open to all and the light that is shined out is a city on a hill. Those are Jesus' own words. And it's not an experiment like we're not sure how it's gonna turn out. Our savior who bled and died for us told us how it was gonna turn out. I'm gonna be king and you're gonna be okay. Is, doesn't that sound a lot like parenting of a three-year-old? I can't explain all the details to you. I understand it, but you're not gonna understand it. Mommy's in charge right now and you're gonna be okay. The kingdom of God is a family and the kingdom of God is a city and it is here right now shining light into a dark place, an example to anybody who would see it of, oh, that's what heaven's gonna look like. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. They are a family, they are a city, they are a nation. And in this nation, what language do you speak? I hope not. Paul didn't speak English. Jesus didn't speak English. Augustine didn't speak English. God is so smart, he can write a book that transcends every culture on planet Earth. We speak the language of heaven. Third, Jesus uses the gospel to transform societies. Sometimes only a few respond. Jesus uses the gospel to transform societies, yet sometimes only a few respond. Let's go to Luke 17. Luke 17, we're going to start at verse 11. Luke 17, verse 11. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 lepers stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. This is what Jewish law required for those that were going to verify that they were healed. Yeah. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. A lot of us think we're gonna get what we need from God without a first step of obedience. That was for free. Verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus. There's a little bit of irony because now he's disobeying Jesus. Jesus said, go to the priest. He flips around immediately. He knows who really healed him. The priest thing is just to verify that he's healed. He flips a UE. Came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. We don't have the time, but this guy should not be on good terms with a Jewish religious teacher. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Brothers and sisters, let's not overthink this one. Were more people blessed by the power of God than those that ended up worshiping God? This is what theologians call common grace. I do not ever have to love, treasure, or recognize God in order to enjoy the feeling of the warm sunshine on my face. I do not have to honor God to enjoy my marriage or maybe to have kids and enjoy being a parent, or to enjoy success in the workplace. There are all kinds of things that any human being could theoretically potentially enjoy, good gifts of God, although I never ever recognize him with a single word off my lips or a single beat of my heart. I go to my grave in consistent and total rebellion, and yet part of what's so damnable is every breath that I breathed was a gift from God. So saving grace transforms my heart and I worship him now, but common grace, anybody can and does experience different types of goodness from God. Nine people were miraculously healed of a horrifying disease and didn't even say thank you to God for doing it. Guys, this is all of us. 
Until the spirit steps in, we will take all kinds of gifts from God and not thank him or not praise him and not honor him, right? We all do this. We all do this. If you were 22 years old, when you first worshiped Jesus with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that was 22 years of grace that you had never thanked him for, right? You breathed, your brain developed, <laughs> you, you had a family, you ate good food with taste buds designed by him, right? Good gifts, and, and anyway. So allow me to use this as an illustration. So because I'm a nerd upon nerd upon nerd, in junior high, I had to write a research paper. I don't remember what the parameters were, but I wanted to read and write a book report on Robert Zubrin's The Case for Mars. And so this was a former NASA employee saying, we should colonize Mars, it'll be awesome. And the foundation of his argument, which I still find compelling, as he said, there are four or five different types of bacteria researchers have found in Antarctica at the South Pole that not only do not need oxygen to live, they produce oxygen. They're like, think of them as tiny, tiny little vegetables. And he said, if we would just put some of this bacteria on a satellite and crash it into Mars, it doesn't even have to land safely. Just put bacteria on Mars that over the eons is gonna grow oxygen. Eventually you could grow things like grasses and eventually you could grow things like trees. Now, how silly would it be to have oxygen showing up everywhere, invading your space. Life is invading your space. But you sat there like this. <gasps> right? And then turn blue. Then turn purple. Then turn cold. Okay. How tragic would it be to be in a desert and people are handing out water and you don't partake? I've told the story before. There was a man who, I believe it was Romania, left his home country to the U.S. to earn money, sent the money home to his mom. And after a few years, tragically, he had heard that his mom had died. And so he goes back to his home country, finds out she has starved to death. And he had no idea how that happened because he'd been sending home $100 bills. And when he goes into her apartment, all of these $100 bills have been stapled to the wall because she didn't know what they were and she used them as wallpaper. Brothers and sisters, light and love are invading our world, but not everybody is recognizing what is being offered freely, graciously by a loving father. We could even be healed of leprosy and not see it. So here's my encouragement to you. If you love Jesus, and I'm gonna tell you that you're being made holy in order to bless those around you, please pursue holiness all the more. You're doing it for God. You're doing it for your own joy. You're doing it for your family and for society around you. So many people are gonna get blessed. If you believe that Jesus saves you into a family, that you're not individual, then in a couple of weeks, we offer signups for summer disciple groups. Jump into one. Jump into one and make friends and allow them to love you and to serve you and to bless you and to grow you. I, I, I'll be bold and I'll be firm and I'll, uh, you might be upset and I'll take it up with Jesus when I get there. There's just no reason for you to remain isolated and think you're gonna grow. There's just no real reason for that. And if you believe that the gospel transforms, is used to transform societies, but sometimes only a few respond, let me encourage you with this. If you are investigating faith, be that one guy, don't be the other nine. That's a choice. You can take every good thing that you've received so far from a benevolent created God and you could choose to worship him. That's a choice you freely have. If you love Jesus already and you're embracing that Jesus uses the gospel to transform societies, I wanna ask you to make a commitment inside yourself. Get a little bit angry. Get a little Holy Spirit angry at yourself and say, I refuse any longer to count on anything other than the gospel to transform culture. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not playing these games anymore. 
There's so, so much noise on television of who's breaking the culture and who can heal it. Convincingly, amazingly, the two sides both think they are the answer. And I read the end of the book. Anybody here read the end of the book? It's all right if you're a guest, you've never, but anybody have read the end of the book? Who saw an elephant? Who saw a donkey? Who saw a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world? Okay, okay. Brothers and sisters, if you love Jesus, we've got to repent of trying to build the kingdom apart from the king. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. So we gotta go somewhere deep down and say, Lord Jesus, I am gonna open scripture and I am going to let it invade me and I'm gonna let it change my character so that I can be a blessing and I'm gonna let the kingdom be exactly what you said the kingdom is. And Jesus says the kingdom is salt and it's light and it's a beautifully large tree with room for everybody. He's the king. He gets to tell us what the kingdom is like and who it's for, right? Anybody who would receive it. Allow me to pray for us and then I'm gonna give instructions for baptism. Jesus, I can't speak for my brothers and sisters in the room, but I do ask your forgiveness. I know the countless times that I have felt something man-made was gonna transform culture instead of the gospel, which is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes Jews first and then Gentiles, Romans 1.16. God, help us to trust you in your building of the kingdom. Help us to trust you. Jesus, for those of us who do not yet love you. We're exploring the Christian faith, exploring the Bible. God, would you help us as we ask questions of our Christian friends or maybe as we read the Bible for ourselves, hopefully, help us to see a kingdom that is so desirable that we gladly submit to the king's leadership. Jesus, for those of you that have walked with you for years, we wanna recommit ourselves in saying, you are king, and that is the best news ever. We're so glad that you are king. We're so glad that you are coming to save this world from its rebellion. You are good, and your love endures forever. Help us to live lives the next six and a half days that are full of praise and honor and glory toward you and resultingly bless the culture around us. In the precious and saving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. God's people said.